So um, if you would like to access the webinar um, after this, if you want to pass it to somebody, if you want to watch it again, uh, I'll show you how to do that. I am going to put you – eh, we'll see how you do. If it gets a little noisy, what I'll do is put the callers on mute. For now, it seems like everybody's muting themselves, so as long as we could kind of continue to keep your phones on mute unless you have a question, um, that should work just fine. Um, I want this to be as interactive as a webinar can be. Uh, I want you to ask questions. I want you to maybe give brief examples of maybe some things that you've uh, seen as successes or uh, you know, lessons learned from, from your world. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to be recorded. Um, it's free. Pass it along to anyone that you, you feel might uh, be interested. And um, with that said, just a quick introduction to myself. So my name is Jim Thompson. I um, started Concentric in Columbus, Indiana in 2003, February 1st. So we just celebrate our 12-year anniversary. Um, we relocated the business from the state of Indiana to South Carolina um, in 2010. Uh, I physically came down here in 2008, uh, but we're located uh, at Meeting in Wentworth, downtown Charleston, for those of you that might know the area. I apologize up front. I'm going to put this on mute because somebody's doing dishes or something. Okay, uh, that's a little better. Um, I'll apologize up front if uh, there's a fire alarm or emergency response. For some reason, when I do a webinar, it tends to uh, prompt emergencies downtown here, but uh, hopefully that won't be a, a, a disruption in this case. So briefly, and I know some of you have probably been involved with past forms, but there are some slides that are um, always worth revisiting just time-wise, kind of the, the, the repetition and, and the timeline of, of the, the changes to the standard. Um, the initial draft, initial discussion period was um, June 2012, and the question really is, uh, do, do we want to change the standard? Do we keep it as is? Does the standard become obsolete? This is kind of a, a rotating process that um, the different technical committees within the auspice of, of ISO um, have to ask themselves every you know, five years or so. So the projected uh, release is September 2005. So you've got about a you know, little over three year cycle time between initial uh, conversation and review and, and release of the, the final um, draft and international standard. <clears throat> so just a, a brief overview of the 9,000 family. Um, we're looking at basically Rev, Rev 5. Uh, we had three revisions in the past. As most of you would know, 2000 was a massive update. And uh, 2008 came along, and really the, the um, adopters in 9001 kind of pushed back globally and said, we're still getting the hang of this process approach from 2000, so let's not uh, do too much too fast. So there are very few changes in 2008. I look at that kind of like, you know, clamping a hose, pinching off a hose, a uh, garden hose out in your lawn, um, and 2015 to be the year where there's a bunch of pin-up changes that have kind of been in the pipeline for, for 15 years. So I expect this to be a, a pretty big deal as far as changes. And, you know, some, some industries, some companies have already adopted uh, through their sector specific standards, some of the things that you're going to see baked into the 2015 version. So some organizations will be way ahead of others, but uh, some that uh, are perhaps just kind of meeting minimum requirements of uh, the current standard, which is the 2008 version, may uh, feel some growing pains. So the current 
structure is an eight clause structure. We kind of went away from the 20 elements into eight clauses. Um, there's over a million companies that are registered globally. Um, you know, 1.2 million is the estimate. That's, that's companies that are registered. Um, so who knows how many additional organizations are out there that are not registered, but they're using 9001 as the baseline for how they manage the day-to-day -day business. So it's a pretty substantial um, reach globally of the number of organizations that get affected when there are changes. Um, you know, you can see here uh, uh, over 140 countries. So let's kind of lay that over 14,001. So 14,001, the structure is different um, than 9001, which has caused a little bit of confusion specifically for us practitioners that are trying to create just one way for a company to do things. Um, the numbering, the the structure, the requirements, some of the key terms are, are different. So uh, 14,001 as well as um, OSAS 18,000, you have the 17 element structure. Um, you can see there's a big uh, adoption factor here as well. It's not 1.2 million, but you've got 200,000 companies registered globally, and that spans 130 countries. Um, right now we're on Rev 2, which is the 2004 version of that environmental standard. And then um, the expectation is late this year, maybe even 2016, you'll see uh, the release of ISO 14001. And the uh, kind of twin cousin of the 14001 or the environmental side um, is this OSAS 18001. Now, this standard is not an ISO standard, so that's why it's uh, OSAS. It's actually a British standard right now, um, but you can see that there's 116 countries that have adopted this standard and, and, and uh, sought registration uh, through a third-party auditor. You've got 55,000-plus organizations registered globally. Um, and the structure of, of this standard, which is uh, health and safety, is aligned with 14,001, which is at 17 elements. So uh, one of the things that you'll see here that, that I think is going to be really cool globally, especially in, in terms of, uh, you know, corporate responsibility, social responsibility, that sort of thing, is the number actually changes. So the reason why the number changes is because it becomes an ISO standard for the first time um, in 2015 late in the year or uh, early next year. So, you know, why, why wouldn't it be considered ISO 18001? Well, um, simply because ISO 18001 is actually already taken. That number is taken as an ISO standard and it has nothing to do with health and safety. So that's just a bit of a background um, in those three very popular standards that will now be um, much better aligned uh, as we move forward in the 2015 version is, um, is released. So before I move forward, I just want to open up the floor. I've taken it off mute if there are any questions at this point. Um, Shoot away. I'll stop about once every um, 10 minutes or so at key transitions. So if you don't have any questions now, you can, um, you can get to those in a bit. But um, any questions? Hey, up to Jim, this point? I've got a quick question. Okay. Um, how that the standards are kind of all lined up and dates. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that now when, when people go to get registered, they're liable to get registered for all three standards at the same time? Yes. I think that's, um, that's inevitable. Um, I, I've already seen that 
uh, from a lot of organizations that are trying to come up with this one management system. Um, I mean, that's where our company name came from, Concentric. The idea is, you know, why recreate, um, you know, why have an auditing team for the HSE side and then an auditing team for uh, the quality side? Why have separate management reviews? Why have separate tools for objectives and targets? Uh, typically, there um, early on in a management system's kind of maturity, you don't see a lot of um, integration. You typically see the HSC person kind of managing that side, and then the quality person divided. But this <clears throat> this is certainly go, going to uh, help foster that integration. So definitely a good question. I also think that um, you'll see savings at least in time and travel when it comes to registration audits or surveillance or re-registration, if you have the same registrar there auditing for compliance to all three standards, you're going to cut costs. Um, so that should be a very interesting um, maturity step forward for a lot of organizations. But uh, I think if you have the bandwidth to manage that and the technical expertise, um, that that integration is a, is a smart way to go. So good question. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to put it on mute and uh, move forward. So here's an example. I kind of alluded to this on the first slide, but um, this is a more graphical example. This came out of Quality Digest late 2014, and it shows that um, that second slide in a bit more detail, where you see um, the draft design spec and and the uh, the the initial kind of the origin of of where are we going to take this thing? You know, do we want to retire it? Do we want to uh, move it forward? Uh, I, I don't imagine 9001 being retired anytime soon, but that's that's an option. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you're you're seeing early on in the cycle is that there are, for example, you see this word comment. So there was uh, a, a very interesting uh, survey basically that would that would go out to um, the delegates from different countries that are a part of of um, the technical committee. And the idea is, what do you want to see in the standard? What do you want changed? You know, what do you, what are your pain points in terms of adopting the standard? And, and from that point, uh, different drafts are sent out and voted against. And, and so we're, we're over here in kind of this phase right here. The last uh, step here is, is publication. Okay. There's one more final, um, draft, uh, final draft international standard that gets voted on, and, and then you'll see publication. So, you know, really the, the question every five years or so is do we revise, use as is, or does the standard uh, deserve to be uh, obsolete? So, just another kind of graphical uh, depiction of that timeline. Um, this is kind of cool because it shows a breakdown of the uh, kind of the spread of 9001 certificates issued. Now, this is about uh, five, four to five years old, but you can see that China and Italy, uh, uh, Italy have um, uh, the majority. I mean, China's got, um, you know, 25 percent of the uh, certifications uh, registered. So uh, another thing that I think is really interesting is when we talk about 9001, we're talking about one standard. Well, ISO has the responsibility for managing 16,500 standards. So, you know, that last slide that we looked at, um, that review, that review cycle, um, that happens a lot, not just with 9001. Um, you see the U.S. is 
down here. And I think per capita, um, Germany has the best uh, rate of um, population industry to uh, to certifications, which uh, really isn't a surprise to me. Germany tends to take the lead in a lot of things, engineering and quality. So just a bit of a background, um, there is this group called TC-176. TC-176 is responsible for um, basically heading up and managing the 9,000 family of documents. Uh, within TC-176, again, TC meaning technical committee, you have these three subcommittees that are responsible uh, for not only the 9001 standard, but also the accompanying documents like the 9000 standard, which is uh, terms and definitions, 9004, which is a guidance document. And then there's a new um, document, which is a, the 10,000 series. So um, I'll talk about that in a little more detail here in a second. But um, back to the solicitation of feedback early on in of the 2012 uh, 2013 uh, time frame there are 122 countries that gave their feedback obviously you know that's a lot of of voices from the customer so out of those 12,000 plus responses um, the the input was rich and uh, was used to 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 serve as a uh, a guidance in in the shape of of the standard so here's an example, just another depiction of kind of the maturity or the stair step from um, a new working item um, all the way up to uh, the final draft international standard. So if you look at the blue box, this is the, um, the draft international standard. What's so significant about this part of the illustration is that in November, November 5th um, of of last year, so you know, almost five months ago, I guess you could say, we've got not only approval of the draft, but a substantial approval rate. So it was nearly 90% of all of those technical committee members that were sitting around the table saying, yes, we, we agree with the, dra the draft international standard, let's move it to dra uh, final draft stage. So the chances of final draft stage not being approved at a level of 75% or, or, or higher in the approval rating, you know, the chances of that being kind of overturned is pretty slim. Um, in terms of an ISO standard or an international standard, you've got to have um, greater than, or I think it's greater than or equal to 75% of the voting members saying, yes, we agree with this standard uh, or this final draft, we now want to make that a released international standard. So that, that event is going to happen sometime um, June, July period, and then the release and publication of the international standard, uh, barring any un, unforeseen issues uh, would come out you know, around September, October timeframe. Uh, one other thing to note, you, you often hear, um, you know, TS as, as something that's thrown out there when talking about standards. Well, the reason for that is because um, TS is considered a technical specification because it didn't get 75% or more of an approval rating. It got somewhere between 66% and you know, 74%. So that's why it's considered a technical specification as opposed to an ISO standard. Just a little, uh, little useless trivia, but if you get asked that on trivia night out at the pub, there you go. Think of me when you uh, inch forward in that contest. <clears throat> so on top of 9001, you have these other special interest and sector specific standards that are that are kind of snapped on top. So 
you know, obviously aerospace, uh, automotive, medical, uh, the telecommunications business. If, if a third or a half of your standard is based on 9001, then certainly you have an interest in uh, contributing to the makeup of that baseline standard. So these folks have been heavily involved as well as other um, industries. So before I get uh, running on Annex S uh, SL, let me open it up for you guys to uh, ask questions at this point. Any questions? All right, that means either you're eating, you're asleep, or uh, everything's going well. So another thing, if uh, if you would like to use the, uh, there's a little chat bubble, um, second from the left, it's right by the telephone. If you're not comfortable with asking a question out loud or you want to um, ask something via chat, you can use that. You can chat to everyone or you can just chat to me. So feel free to use that as well. Okay. So to address one of the questions that I was asked earlier about the alignment, um, there's this document called Annex SL. Uh, last month, someone asked me, what does SL mean? Does that mean, you know, Mexico or where, where is that from? Um, it's actually was the next uh, serial number in line or the alpha uh, numeric number in line in terms of, of an annex to uh, the, the set of ISO standards. So it doesn't stand for anything. It's not short for anything. It's just, uh, you know, it's kind of like, uh, 16949, that was the next number uh, in line. So there's some other useless quality trivia for you, but that was asked and I promised to, to look into that. Um, the purpose of this document is to basically make sure that there's alignment between uh, management system standards. So it's really the standard for standards. Um, that's also something that's really new. So let me um, move to this, <clears throat> this next slide. So the idea here is that you've got perfect alignment um, in what is expected for, let's say, leadership. So leadership has the responsibility for, um, you know, these systems, quality, environmental, health and safety. So if you were to, um, let's say, create a procedure or create some sort of document under um, clause or element five, um, that document could more easily cover all three of these these items. Uh, same thing for um, improvement, let's say uh, corrective action. Well, there's better alignment because in clause 10 is where you're going to see um, improvement items, uh, improvement um, requirements, uh, you know, uh, you see alignment across all three of those systems. So I think this is a, a great move and I'm looking forward to it. But another thing to, to look after is this is kind of the meat and potatoes of the standard right here. Um, this is uh, kind of the preface stuff. Uh, there aren't really requirements in clause one, two, and three. So you'll have, instead of clauses four through eight, you'll have clauses four through 10 now. And those clauses, you can see, use um, different headers. So leadership, uh, currently this, this section would be uh, um, uh, management responsibility, okay? Um, this one right here is, you'll see, you know, that the continual versus continuous, that's dropped, thankfully, and, and we're just using improvement. So. Um, I'll get into a, a couple of other key changes as we go, but um, the alignment should be a benefit and help streamline management system uh, administration. So ex expectations for the transition. Um, there, there was some talk early on as to whether 
the transition period should be shorter than it had been in the past, but uh, I'm happy to see that uh, we're following suit with previous transition timelines. So the idea is um, within a three-year transition period from um, the the release of the standard, you should be moving up to the uh, the, the 2015 version. Uh, my recommendation is to talk directly with your current registrar, and I'm going to actually go as far as try to never change things on the fly, but this is so important, I don't want to leave it out. Okay, talk to your registrar and probably more importantly, talk to your customers. Uh, that's a, a, a huge first step. So if, if there's something that you should get started on right away, it would be prompting this discussion with your customers, with your registrar. What is their expectation? Um, back in 2001, 2002 timeframe, um, an example where companies may have been caught off guard if they didn't talk to their customer. Uh, so Daimler Chrysler at that time uh, came along and said, okay, you can move from QS 9000 to ISO TS 16949 over a three-year period. So saith ISO and so saith the, the automotive um, task force. But if you're our suppliers, in terms of a tier one supplier to one of our assembly plants, we're going to cut this three-year period in half, and it's going to be 18 months. So if you didn't get uh, started on that right away, you were in a world of hurt uh, come 2000, um, 2004, 2000, 2003, 2004 uh, time frame. So check in with your customers. Make sure that they do not have an accelerated uh, transition plan for you. Uh, if they don't, then 2018 is going to be your deadline. Um, you know, starting in 2016, you'll start to see, um, you know, more more assertive companies requesting uh, a transition audit from their registrar. Um, the idea is that you want to avoid bottlenecks. The registrars are saying this. The industry practitioners are saying this. Do not wait until Q4 2018. Um, if you do, you're likely to have a lapse in your certification, and um, that's not good. So start thinking about that now. If you have a um, if you have an audit, which a lot of folks do, that falls in Q4, think about moving that perhaps to Q2 or Q3, because uh, there's certainly uh, not a balanced auditing schedule across the industry. So that, that might uh, be something worth looking into. Uh, also, a, you know, something to talk to your registrar about. So highlights from the current draft. Um, at the highest level, you've got the structure that we talked about that's changed. Um, and then there are three other subsequent annexes that are in the back of the draft at this point. Uh, annex A, Annex B, and Annex C. So Annex A is really clarification of some of the, the standard requirements that you'll find up in Clause 1 through 10. Uh, annex B is uh, the 10 quality management system, or seven quality management system principles versus the eight that we see now. And then um, I had talked about that 10,000, ISO 10,000 earlier. Um, that's where this will be discussed. So let me, let me uh, move forward and I'll address those in, in further detail here. <clears throat> so one of uh, the changes here is uh, this new language that's referred to as the context of your organization. And the idea there is that we need you to be and to think, you know, more deliberately and more clear on what your organization actually is. Who is the organization? Where is their offense line? Um, 
who would you consider as an interested party? Um, what processes uh, are managed internally versus processes that are, are managed externally? Uh, for example, uh, you might have recruiters within your facility that are your employees, but you might have a fence line here and let's say you only use a recruiting company that's actually a supplier or you have parts suppliers that you use or you do some sort of you know calibration that's done outside and some part of calibration is done inside so the idea is that um, you want to start out with uh, you know improving your management system by first defining what is your management system? Who are the interested parties? Who are the, what are all the components? What are all the pieces of the management system versus those that are someone else's responsibility? So that's what the um, what, uh, context of the organization in 4.1 um, is, uh, is going to require. Um, 4.3 is uh, scope and applicability. So Unlike what we're currently seeing where you can um, you can exclude clause 7.3 because you don't design products, there's no reference to an allowance of exclusions in this standard. There would just be um, some uh, portions of the standard, some requirements of the standard that just aren't applicable. So um, ideally, it's whatever it takes to, to meet the customer expectations. So this this illustration is just meant for you to again show very clearly where is your property line what processes what responsibility uh, lie with um, an outside provider versus um, in this case you the homeowner and funny thing is I just paid about six hundred dollars last fall um, and I had a water leak and it was right here and because it was one inch on the side of the valve uh, that the, the water company uh, owned. You know, the water company said anything that happens on this side, uh, we're responsible for, but anything on that side, you're responsible for. So, you know, it's funny how it tends to be that failures are, are really close here. And that's because uh, a lot of times there's breakdowns and, and handoffs and interactions and valves and couplings and, you know, all that sort of thing. So anyway, you need to be very, very clear on the definition of your management system, the scope and applicability, which processes belong to, to, to which party. Um, questions. Okay, I'm going to press on. So, uh, as indicated earlier, when we first looked at the, the new structure, the 1 through 10, uh, leadership is uh, the language used versus top management, which I like. Um, leadership is kind of a term that's earned versus top management. It's just like uh, the guy whose butt's in that seat at the very top. So I like leadership a lot. I think that's a really good uh, alignment with what the rest of the business world um, calls that, that level. Um, you know, the, there's not a lot changed here, but, but the thought is that the leadership of the organization is responsible for deploying, communicating the, the, the policies and objectives being aligned to those policies. So very similar to what we see now, the commitment of leadership is going to be um, even uh, uh, more of a challenge uh, to demonstrate. So if you're working in an organization where you have one person that's actually the more of the management system um, administrator and you're saying that person is responsible for the QMS or the EMS, um, you need to start uh, disseminating that, uh, that management system out to, to the natural process owners within your organization because that's going to be um, something that's scrutinized a bit more um, in, the, uh, in the future. 
The other idea is that you have a compatibility with your bus business management system. And um, I, I think that uh, this is a very interesting point and probably a nice break for some of you management systems out there. The management system representative can be more than one person. So currently with, let's say, uh, the automotive standard, uh, there is this person called or a role called customer representative, and it allows for multiple people to be the representative and kind of the face of, uh, of the customer. That's really kind of the approach that you're seeing here with the 2015 revision is that you can divvy up um, that management responsibility role to more than one person where currently um, that's a, a single person. So I think that's a good move as well. QMS planning, um, clause 6.1. So the idea here is uh, you need to evaluate opportunities. Um, we have this thing called risk-based thinking. So what are your opportunities in business what are your threats or, or those weaknesses? You know, what, if you look at a, at a SWOT analysis chart, for those of you who've used the SWOT analysis as a, a very simple tool, you kind of, you can kind of say, well, a threat is a negative aspect and a weakness is a, a negative aspect and the strengths are positive and the opportunities are maybe those positives that we haven't quite captured yet. Um, you know, a, a big, big focus and a big change, a big pivot to the standard right now is is going to be this right here, these two. And in the current version of the standard, we call this thing preventive action, but no one really seems to get preventive action. So I'm a big fan of the fact that uh, we now have this uh, strand of words. It's not called risk management or risk man. Uh, mitigation. It, it's called risk-based thinking, uh, which is a very interesting, uh, broad way to say that whatever you're doing, um, be it planning for your business or making changes to your business, uh, you need to be thinking about risk-based targets, goals, objectives. You need to be looking at, you know, how do you, <coughs> how do you, uh, how do you manage the, the risk that you're capable of managing uh, and, and are you willing to deliberately live with those risks that you can't, um, you know, fully manage? There, there are certain inherent risks to any business. And so the idea is that you come up with, with that type of approach to thinking about and deploying, planning, deploying, checking, and, and action related to, to risk. So, um, preventive action is going to go away. I love that because a lot of times I'll, uh, I'll audit a, a, an organization and I'll see 2,000 corrective actions and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, okay, the audit's tomorrow. Let's hurry up and, and create a PAR real quick uh, just to check the box and say, hey, we, we've done something that's preventive. So, this is going to be a good move. So I had a question, is it better to use SWOT instead of FMEA? I'm presuming uh, it's better to use both. My recommendation is start uh, slow. Uh, start with a SWOT analysis. You don't need any fancy sheets. You, you, it's, it's an exercise. You could just look SWOT analysis up, um, you know, Google it. But, you know, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are our opportunities? What are our threats? Stick it up on a, a board and for every single process you have in your facility, uh, have the process owner get their team together and just start listing these things out. Which of those um, specifically uh, threats and weaknesses uh, should we be taking some sort of action on? I think a SWOT analysis is a much, much easier, more fundamental tool to use. Um, so graduate from the SWOT analysis and then move your way up to the spectrum of, uh, of an FMEA, which is a failure modes and effects analysis tool. Um, 
Very good question. Uh, both are great. I would look at the SWAT as kind of a 50,000 or, uh, you know, a, a 50,000 foot view of what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats as a business. And then also maybe at the, at the 5,000 foot level, which is um, in our respective processes within our business, let's do a, a more micro level um, SWOT analysis. It's an easy tool, very simple to use, very easy to train, but just gather around quickly and and see what type of risk bubble to the top of the surface. So very good question. Thanks for asking that. So let me deep dive a bit into uh, risk and this risk-based thinking. So the thought is you want to you want to look at risk. So let's look at this illustration here on the right. This is um, basically a, a 3D blueprint, uh, 3D model of your home. So let's, let's think about taking the top off of your operations and uh, looking at your operations like you would look at your home. So what you want to do is maybe gather your family around or your, your work family at work and look at, you know, if we know that the kitchen is the number one riskiest place, uh, let's lay out what are all the risks in the kitchen. Uh, what can we do to minimize those risks from, from spreading to the rest of the house? Maybe it's fire prevention. Maybe it's a smoke detector. Uh, hey, perfect timing as a fire truck goes by. And I swear that's not somebody uh, next to me with the fancy sound effect. So the idea is evaluate those risks in a macro um, approach and then go micro approach. Let's look at uh, the bedroom. Let's look at the bathroom. Um, plan for those risks. You know, what is acceptable risk? What is unacceptable risk? Uh, what, what is the probability of risk? And what is the severity of a particular risk? So, you know, I look at let's sit down with my family and map out uh, risk A all the way through risk Z, and then let's do an analysis of how probable is it that we'll have a fire in the kitchen? Well, it's pretty, it's pretty probable that, that it, it happens in one in 15 houses. I, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but, uh, and let's first start focusing on high probability times high severity. So if it happens all the time and you've got, uh, you know, a 90% probability here and then the severity is, uh, you know, death, obviously you want to start with that risk first. If you've got, you know, A through Z, you've got 20, 26 risks, maybe K is, uh, is, is uh, kind of the, the the, the highest level, highest probability times the highest severity. That's a big darn deal. Start with that. Make your improvements. Uh, do what you need to do to to um, minimize the probability or or uh, you know remove that from happening in the first place, and and just go down that list. So I had another question, and the question is, uh, what's the difference between risk-based and an FMEA. So risk-based is more of a methodology and an FMEA is um, an analysis tool of all of your A through Zs, you know, collecting all of your A through Zs and looking at the effects of those A through Zs. So I would say, you know, your risk-based thinking is a methodology. Your FMEA is a very prescriptive tool to get down to uh, the nitty gritty and, and prioritize all of your, uh, your failure modes. So you could say whenever you hear risk, um, you can also look at that as a, as a failure mode. So those two kind of act together. Is there another tool? Yes. There, uh, fault tree analysis. There, there are, um, there are all kinds of tools related to um, 
a risk assessment. I mean, you can you can create one on your own. You can say, what's the probability of, of risk A happening? Um, if your name's Ted, make it the Ted matrix. So risk A, the probability is, is 3%. And, and the severity uh, is uh, 14%. And you come up with some sort of indicator and you hit the sort button and then the one that's rising to the top is the one that you you uh, you work on first so um, one thing I'd like to do for the next I'll put this down and making a note of it for the next um, session or actually I need to, to get a um, some uh, examples of risk some tools to use for risk and uh, put that in a blog and um, kind of bake that into maybe our, our next session next month. So, so examples of risk based tools. So let me, let me take the cheap way out and um, ask you, give me some, um, Give me some tools that you guys currently use that, that you seem to uh, have success with that work well. Anybody have any uh, input? Hey, Jim, this is Fran, and uh, actually right now I'm in Georgia. Uh, you know, honestly, my company doesn't use this space now. That's one of the reasons why I'm in the now. It's a good idea to be useful. And uh, we were looking at FMEA. Uh, now I'm going to go back and look at SWOT analysis. But we, we're trying to get ideas for, for our company as well. Okay. Uh, someone else had typed a cause and effects matrix. That's good. Um, you know, type in Google uh, C&E matrix. Um, someone else said they use a mini FMEA. That, that's fine. I mean, these are tools, if your customer or your industry or this, you know, a sector specific standard doesn't force you to use that, come up with something that works well for you. Um, I've also ran into people uh, that struggle to find a tool or a gadget to work for them, or they, they struggle to find real numbers. You know, how do I know if it's 3% or 14%? In that case, my recommendation is that you, you look at market data. You know, let's say uh, you're not sure how, what percentage the kitchen catches on fire. You know, go out and do some research industry-wide. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have information specifically for your block or your building, but you can look at probability over a bigger population um, another thing you can do that's very simple is just do a survey. You know, what is your perception within um, the uh, within our day-to-day -day business or within our, our our house of if we look at risk A through Z, rank them in probability and severity based on your opinion. Um, you start there, and and then you can get more scientific, then you can put the measurement systems in place to give you real data. Uh, but the idea is you get started, you get started now, and there should be some things that you can do that would be considered low hanging fruit. They're just things that are very simple to do to, to um, you know, prompt that, that risk-based thinking. Okay, I'm gonna put you on mute again and press ahead. So thanks for the comments. I appreciate that. I will uh, take that as an action item and, and look at a couple more things uh, to bake in here as far as recommended tools um, and uh, share that uh, during the presentation next week. Um, so here's a little Dilbert cartoon. Um, I'll need a project plan to justify the resources we need to change our software. And that's what Dilbert's boss is saying. And Dilbert says, I can... I can make those software changes in 10 seconds done. And his boss says, good work. 
Now all we need is that plan. So, you know, th this illustration is uh, is meant to, uh, you know, get you to think, you know, what things need an extreme amount of planning? What things can you just go and change? You know, Dilbert might have made made a change here that impacted someone else in another department. So um, the idea is that you're using risk-based thinking and making sure that you have proper controls in place when you make change. So almost like that handoff of the fence line between where the, the utility company owned the bursted pipe or the leak versus me as a process owner, anytime you change, you make a change, there is an inherent risk to uh, doing something different or your output from a process is changed, which then becomes a, a foreign input into the next process. So uh, change management and risk management or risk-based thinking are two, um, two aspects of the standard that uh, we'll really need to be focusing on and, uh, and being proactive and forward thinking um, as we mature our management systems. Um, let's see here. Okay. I was just looking at some of the other chats. I think I've addressed all of those questions so far. So necessary knowledge. I think this is great as well. Um, let's get rid of the term competency. Um, I don't like competency. It seems to be negative. But the idea is, do you have the necessary knowledge within your system, either the people or the tools or the work instructions, you know, in order to achieve your desired result? So one of the tips that I use, because I get asked all the time, what's the appropriate balance of documentation? And one of my tips is where absence of documents equals a nonconformity, then put a document there or put some other pokey yoke there, put a more advanced or knowledgeable person in that job. So this is again, kind of like leadership. It's a lot more um, action based. It's a lot more uh, in line with, with business language uh, versus competency and, you know, that sort of thing. So I think that's a good change. I'll, I'll spend more time on that. And if, um, future session as well. So Annex A, we talked about that. It's a clarification of the new structure terms and it gets into a little bit more guidance on what the risk-based uh, risk approach is. B is your management principles. So this management principle right here kind of goes away. Um, improvement is here. The process approach is here. Uh, just some minor tweaks. Um, instead of supplier relationships, you should be looking at a more holistic approach. You know, those interested parties that have some connection or impact to your business, which could be a supplier, uh, certainly is a customer. It could be the neighborhood that's right out back from your facility. Um, it could be a business partner, a, a, an affiliate. So those that is much more broad. Um, continual gets dropped and you see continue, uh, continual, continuous, that debate goes away. We're just dealing with improvement. So those are your seven management principle, principles versus eight. That'll be in uh, Annex B. Annex C gives you a, a kind of a new look at what's called the, the 10,001 portfolio, which means the 10,001 portfolio is the umbrella for all QMS family of, of, of standards. So anything underneath, including uh, the 9000 series would be uh, under this 10,001 umbrella. And the idea is you use your quality management system to drive uh, organizational excellence. And uh, so that becomes a, another addition um, to the back of the, uh, the standard. So next steps, um, we're a month to two to three months out in terms of uh, the the final um, the final uh, draft international standard being published and or not published but um, um, approved. And the idea is 
somewhere Q3, Q4, 2015, we'll see the, the new standard. So um, that's kind of the stair step there. So tr- uh, transitioning. So the idea is you're going to start now, uh, but maybe officially starting with some of the, the, the really heavy lifting in September or, or Q4, early 2016, and then being transitioned um, early 2018, if you can, don't wait till September 2018. Uh, so real quick, we're about out of time. I want to show you some, some good uh, resources here. I want to move over to um, the actual internet rather than screenshots of it. But um, if you go to our website, um, you will see it says ISO changes right here. If you click there or you can go under here or you can just in a search bar put 9001-2015. Either way, it'll bring you to uh, this really rich resource page that every month uh, we add things to. So here's the recording from February's webinar. So if you want to take this and forward it to someone else that you work with, your suppliers, whatever, uh, you can even use the share feature and share it to social media. Um, it doesn't cost anything. It's just, you know, there it is. Um, these are articles. So as, as we come across articles, uh, not only me, but uh, other subject matter experts within our organization, uh, they'll send that to me and uh, we'll bake these in while well, the Ronnie, the web goddess will bake these in uh, as well as key links. So the stuff that's here isn't all of ours. This is stuff that uh, is a collection of, of various useful resources that are all free um, out in the inner, uh, inner beings and interweb at this particular time. Um, we'll also continue to put dates and registration information for future forms here. So if you want to come to the next one, that's how you get to it. We come back over here. Uh, you can also subscribe if you want. I hate email, so I wouldn't subscribe if, if I were me. Uh, but you know, a lot of people like emails. When we publish something that's new related to a, a blog or an update to this site, it would send you an email and uh, keep you abreast of, of ongoing changes. Uh, these are all the, the other ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, our address is uh, 266 meeting. So if you're in, your, if you're in the area, um, stop by, knock on the door, say hello. Um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, or email. But these are all different ways that uh, you can get in touch with us. And um, yeah, if you need any other means of getting a hold of us that's not on here, I would be surprised. But those are all the ways you can get in touch with us. Um, I'm Jim. Megan and Ronnie are uh, here as well, uh, here in the office. And then our subject matter experts are kind of strolling all over, uh, all over the U.S. But uh, that's how you get in touch with us. So any last-minute questions or comments? Questions, comments, ridicules? Hey, Jim, this is Lee Pope. How are you? Hi, Lee. I've got a question that I need to ask you offline after this is over okay. with. It. Okay. Yeah, let um, – why don't you do this? Call this number in five minutes, uh, 843-469-8279, and I'll take your question. Okay. Um, the next the next webinar, good question, is um, hasn't been posted yet. But where are we? We're the 25th, so it should be either the 22nd or the 29th, Wednesday, the 22nd or 29th at noon. We try to do these every um, third or fourth Wednesday of the month. So, good question. If um, if you are interested in, like I said, staying up to date on 
announcements such as when the next one's going to be, just go to any page on our website, put your email address. You can even make up a, you know, funny first and last name if you want to. But when you hit subscribe, it'll put you on the mailing list for, uh, for those invitations. So any other questions? All right, I will stop recording. I'm going to leave this um, the session actually going for a couple of minutes. So if you need to uh, ask something via chat, um, you can do that as well. So thanks again. We should have the uh, Ronnie will have the the recording up probably by within the next 24 to 48 hours. So check back if you want to um, uh, look at the video uh, at some point in the future. So. Thanks so much and uh, have a great day.